Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Crafting and Crime Daily. It is frigid here in Wichita and from what I understand, most of the country. So I've got my sweatshirt on and uh, my banana hat, my space heater, and my electric blanket. Because my uh, studio here, my craft room, is in a converted garage and it's kind of chilly. And the cat is pitching a fit because he can't go outside. <laughs> I didn't even walk the dog today. I said, go do your business and come right back. And she did. So welcome. Today, uh, I'm going to cover the day one of the Michelle Traconis trial. It started yesterday as planned with a few surprises. Yeah. But first, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. It's free. Don't charge a thing. Hit that notification bell, hit all so you don't miss a single episode. You can also catch this as a podcast on YouTube Music. So let's get into it. Day one of the trial. So we listen to the judge do the jury instructions. Blah, 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 blah. We've heard them a hundred times, a thousand times. Yeah, nothing different about that. Here's what was different. No opening statements. They don't do them in Connecticut. I looked, I, when they, I kept rewinding and fast forwarding. I'm like, did I miss something? Because after the instructions were read, they took a break. So I thought, okay, when they come back, we're going to hear opening statements. No, nope. and I'm glad I didn't go live for it because it didn't happen. They went right into calling their first witness, the prosecution. So I looked it up and it says, um, it's, it's up to the judge's discretion about whether or not there are going to be opening statements. And the parties can ask the judge to make an opening statement, and he may or may not let them. But they said it, it's only unusual circumstances that you'll get opening statements in the state of Connecticut. Okay. Who knew? My girlfriend, Color and Chat with Joanna, lives in Connecticut. Hey, Joanna, did you know that? Stitch, honey. He doesn't know what to do with himself. I think he's late for a date or something. Okay, so the first officer that was on the stand at the time, well, maybe I should give you a little background on the case. Let me tell you about, about this case. Michelle Traconis is on trial for conspiracy to commit the murder of Jennifer Dulos. At the time, she was uh, she Jennifer had divorced Fotis Dulos, and Fotis was living with Michelle Traconis and her daughter. But Jennifer and Fotis had five children, two sets of twins, and they were renting a home in uh, an affluent neighborhood in Connecticut. So they had gone through this divorce, but there was a lot of child custody issues and it was very contentious. And on the morning of May 24th, 2019, Jennifer goes missing, and her body has never been found. This is a no-body murder. Yeah. She is presumed deceased. So that's uh, kind of the backstory. There's a whole lot more to it, though, because Fotis, after he was arrested and he bonded out, paid $6 million, $6 million bond. I don't know how much he paid to bond out, but it was a $6 million bond. It, oh my God, the wind out there is crazy. So he committed suicide. He was supposed to be, he was due in court to for a bond hearing, probably to reduce his bond. And he and his current girlfriend, because by, by the time Michelle and Fotis were actually charged with the murder and conspiracy to commit the murder of Jennifer Dulos, Time had passed since the day of her disappearance, and Michelle and Fotis had broken up. She had moved out, was living somewhere else. So the morning of that hearing, Fotis and his current girlfriend were going to go to that hearing together. And he says, no, let's take separate cars. So she leaves and goes to the courthouse. And on the way to the courthouse, she gets a call from his lawyer and his lawyer says, Where, where's Fotis? And she says, well, we took separate cars. He's on his way. And he says, no, his GPS tracker is showing that he's still at the house. She's like, oh, my God, call 911. They, you know, first responders get to the house. He has committed um, 
he has ended his life. And I don't think you're allowed to say that word on YouTube, so I'm not going to say it. He ended his life by carbon monoxide poisoning. Now, he didn't die that day. They resuscitated him, took him to the hospital. He had a chance to visit with his children, um, or his children got to see him. He was on life support before they basically um, took him off life support and pronounced him dead. Stitch, baby, <laughs> come here. Come here. You want to say hi to the peoples? Say hi, peoples. I've got some cashews here. He's he's interested. He's silly kitty kitty. What are you going to do today? He's so bored. He likes to spend his day sleeping out under this tree in the backyard. <laughs> and it's just not happening today. Anyway. So the uh so no opening statements, like I said. And they get right into the first witness. So the first witness is obviously the first responding officer to the home of Jennifer Dulo. So what happened was that morning she drops off her children at their school. All of her five children are between the ages of like eight and 12 at the time. She drops them off at school. She goes back home and she's got two doctor's appointments in New York City. And according to the nanny, she had been planning to take her Range Rover to these two doctor's appointments. So she opted not to take the Range Rover and because um, that was still at the home when this first officer arrived. And she took her other vehicle, which was a Chevy Suburban. Now, what the heck? A Chevy Suburban and a Range Rover? What kind of money did this woman have? Well, I do know that her maternal aunt and uncle founded Liz Claiborne. So. That, that kind of gives you an idea. So <clears throat> the nanny calls the police. They said, you know, she didn't go to her doctor's work. We got a call from the doctor saying she didn't show up at her appointment and uh, she hasn't come to get the kids. So this officer kept referring to her, her as the babysitter. I'm assuming this is the same. I'm assuming he means nanny, but I don't know. That wasn't really clarified. So he he's saying that the the police got a call from the babysitter that she hadn't come home. So this person that called gives the police officer the code to get into her garage. So he gets there. Another officer comes with him. Like I said, at the time he was a sergeant. He, they knock on the front door of this home. Now, check, uh, check this out. Wow. Wow. Look. Wow. Yeah. Just, it's gorgeous. Um. They knock on the door and there's no answer. So they wait a little while, knock again, no answer. So they go to the garage and enter in the code. Do, do, do. Enter in the code, go in, there's the Range Rover. So they don't they don't really look at it too closely, but so they go ahead and they enter the home. And it's around seven o'clock at night now. Not dark. But when they were going through the houses, through the house to look for her. And they were searching in all these obvious places or, you know, anywhere where you might find a person under the bed, in a closet. They're looking everywhere, but they're not turning on any lights. So the body cam footage is, is a little dark. Um, you can tell that it's still light outside, but inside it's kind of dark. And But I lost count of how many bedrooms they went in. And the master bathroom had a soaker tub. Like, that's my dream, a soaker tub. Oh, my God. What? Yeah. Um, so they're not finding her. They look everywhere. Like, and everything is neat and tidy. Nothing is out of place. This home is gorgeous. The kids' rooms, nothing out of place. The only place where you could tell, like, signs of life was the playroom, which was because it's three stories, this house. On the third floor, when you get up to the third floor, almost like in an attic, a built-out attic, they had a playroom. There's a couch and there's toys scattered about. So obviously that's probably where they spent most of their time as a family. Um, but no signs of Jennifer. So they, um, and I might add, these guys are not wearing gloves. They're not touching a lot of stuff, but they're not wearing gloves. So, you know, they're opening drawers and I don't know why, but they're opening drawers and cabinets and, you know, looking around, opening closets. 
uh, looking in crawl spaces. They're not finding anything. So they get back down to the kitchen and they see that her purse and jacket are there. And the babysitter uh, told them, I guess over the phone, she wasn't present during this, had told them, you know, her purse, her purse, she would always take that with her. It wouldn't be there. So her Chevy Suburban is not there, but the Range Rover is there. And during this body cam footage that they played for the jury, it was about 20 minutes long. Um, and they actually go down to a basement as well. There's an unfinished basement with these French doors that open the backyard. I mean, this house was amazing. <laughs> Big plot of land, you know, just gorgeous. So um, they go back into the kitchen and then they go out and they look at the Range Rover again and they're walking around the Range Rover and they find some blood and they find a bloody footprint or they don't they don't call it a bloody footprint they call it a footprint a foot a shoe impression that looks like it could be blood and it's a blood splatter that goes all the way down the right side of you know the driver not the right side the left side the driver's side of the vehicle also um some spots on the range rover that look suspicious so they're taking pictures but the guy's like oh my flash isn't working why don't we have better cameras <laughs> and the sergeant's go, i don't know so while they're doing this and they're photographing it they get you can hear over their radio that they get a call from someone else i think it was their lieutenant saying we found the vehicle it was parked on a road that's an entrance to a park called waveney park this park is 250 acres they have a frisbee golf course on there they have all these trails you can follow and it's just this amazing huge park so sh the the vehicle was parked there so they get in their cars and they go over to the vehicle uh, but before they do they call the state police i know i can't do anything about your issue today they call the state police because these uh these are local guys it's the new cannon police department and they don't have much resources there not to investigate a major missing person's case where you find the vehicle and the purse and blood splatter so they call in the state police and they come out and begin their investigation so these two officers they go over to where the vehicle is found and the vehicle is parked on the side of the road with the passenger side almost up against this large tree trunk but this large tree like you can't even open that passenger door um that was kind of weird and there was nothing in the vehicle they actually had it towed to some place where they could investigate the vehicle further. But these two officers said they, they walked the trails, some of the trails, and then they called in canine. And the canine officer uh, took his dog on some of the trails. But he says, you know, I don't really have a good sense of Jennifer. So they said, well, come over to the house. We'll get something that has her scent. So they go in the kitchen where that jacket was, and they put it out in the driveway so the dog can get Jennifer's scent, but he, he never does find anything, the dog. Very interesting. So I just want to go through my notes, make sure I haven't forgotten anything. Um, they were using flashlights in the house. That's one of the things they, um, and they said when the state police began their investigation, they did uh, take these two officers' fingerprints and palm prints so that they could be ruled out as a suspect. Because they weren't wearing gloves when they were, they were looking for somebody. They weren't expecting to, that this would turn into a crime scene, but it was declared a crime scene. And um, yeah, so her purse was actually found in between the kitchen and the mudroom. And then they also found in her jacket the keys to the Chevy Suburban. They found uh, on the garbage can lid, they, they, they were going through the kitchen garbage, but they found on the garbage can lid uh, a substance that looked, appeared to be blood. 
So at this point, you know, now the state police are there. They're investigating. It's a crime scene. So this officer, together with another officer, they go, they start canvassing the neighborhood, which is routine. And they, they're looking for ring cameras or those surveillance, any kind of surveillance camera that could have caught her vehicle coming and going. So they do end up with a neighbor's camera that shows the vehicle leaving the house at 7.08 now, what is it? Oh, 7.58 a.m. Here's a picture of the vehicle leaving the house. It returns to the house at 8.05 a.m. And this is the Chevy Suburban. And he says, we knew it was her Chevy Suburban because it had some stickers or something on it that they knew about. Then, uh, again, leaving their home at 10.25 a.m. Then the next person on the stand was um, another patrol officer, but she is the liaison for the school where Jennifer Dulos dropped her five children off that day. So she went to the school and they had surveillance footage there uh, and they could see that she had dropped off those children at 8.03 a.m. And she was asked, you know, what time does school start? And she goes, well, it varies based on what grade they're in, but Anywhere between 8.15 and 8.30, their day starts, but they're allowed to drop the kids off anywhere between 7.45 and 8.30. So that was her testimony. So the next person on the stand was a state police officer. And I'm not going to lie to you, I didn't listen to the whole thing. I'm going to catch up today, and I will bring you more on Monday. Yes, also going to do some true crime stuff next week. Yeah, we're not going to do court cases every single day, but yeah, we're going to do some true crime stuff. So now the crafting portion of the show. So yesterday I, I, you know, I got this in the mail, this bed of roses Afghan kit. And I want to thank my su subscriber, Berta. She's a member of my channel. She made a substantial donation to the channel, which allowed me to purchase this. And so I was determined, you could see it in my Wednesday live this past week, that I was a little bit of, it's not that I couldn't read the pattern, it's just that it wasn't making sense to me why I would need to carry the yarn on a row where there was no, you didn't need that yarn. So, because I had just come off making this corner, the corner for Afghan. So apparently, so I looked up on YouTube, um, tapestry crochet, and the and you do carry it. The reason you carry it uh, that way is so that once you're done with a pattern, it looks good on the front and the back. Instead of having the back, like, have all these edges sewn in, you know. And then you're just, it, it makes the project so much easier. So I did figure it out. I got a little frustrated on Wednesday, but I was determined and I figured it out. So I was working on it yesterday. So here it is. Now it's a little rough because, you know, like I said, I just figured it out. And, uh, you know, your question is, can you see the pink through the white? You can, but I don't really mind that. I love pink. I think it gives kind of a unique look. So here it is. Um, so I am carrying the, the pattern, the, the pink all the way through it. But this is one side this is the other so they looks good on both sides and i did look at this up close and you can see when you look at it up close that they are carrying that yarn all the way through it the lavender i think there's another picture in here oh the one on the back if you look really closely it's it's, it's very hard to see but you can see that they carried the lavender all the way through so if you look in the white probably can't see it on camera, but I can see that they carried the lavender all the way through. But that's how I want mine to look. So um, I didn't realize that I should be pulling this taut. See, you can kind of see it here. I should have been pulling it taut. So here I pulled it taut, and then I'm going to hide these threads when I do the border. But what I did was I am following this graph. And what I did was I blew up the graph so that I could mark off the rows as I went. So this is as far as I've gotten on this graph pattern, which is 27 rows into it. 
basically that bottom portion there. Okay, so that is that today. I'm going to be working on a crazy cat lady. I will be on Mickey Sunshine Lives, or Mickey Sunshine Creates Live tonight, and I will show you then um, my progress on that. I didn't get as far as I wanted to this week because, frankly, it's cold in this room. <laughs> And I was actually doing this crochet in a, a warmer room, which I may do that as well this weekend, which might put me behind on the diamond painting. But you know what? I don't stress over it. Last night, I was laying in bed and uh, I wasn't tired. And I'd already watched my show. Oh, my gosh. There's a new Harlan Corbin. I, he's an author and he writes they've adapted a lot of his books into these limited series netflix has and they have another one on that i just started it's called oh my god oh my god it has fool in the title <laughs> i don't know what it is uh siri or alexa what's the latest harlan corbin novel on netflix one moment while i find a here's a crime thriller by Harlan Coben, you might like. Promise me, Myron Bali Car, book eight, from Audible. Fifteen dollars and thirty. That's not the one. Try saying things like here are summary, get ratings on Netflix numbers. Delete the experience at any time. Just say stop. Stop. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Okay, never mind. <laughs> not answering my question, dang Um anyway, look for it on um look up Harlan Corbin. On Netflix, you'll find that show. So I was laying there and I said, you know, I'm not tired. And that office of mine, because we've got three bedrooms here, and the third bedroom is my eBay office. And I said, it is a wreck. Every Amazon box that came through here during Christmas and birthday time got empty box. The boxes got thrown into that room because I like to save them for shipping. So I went in there and started breaking down boxes. I'm in my pajamas, my plaid jammies, and I'm breaking down boxes. My sister's like, what are you doing? Breaking down boxes. Midnight last night, breaking down boxes. And then I started uh, condensing, because I've sold a lot of things. So I started condensing stuff in the different containers. Because my plan is to move some of this stuff that you don't see behind the camera into that room. Because this room is starting to look a hoarders, you know, like a hoarders episode. I want to put, I have a desk in that room that I want to put in here just for my watercolor painting. So I don't have to get it out and put it away, get it out and put it away. But anyway, more on that later. So um, yeah, I will keep you abreast of this uh, Traconis trial. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I will see you. Have a great weekend. Stay warm, stay inside. <laughs> And I will see you in the next episode. Love you all. Bye.